Hi, everyone. I'm Arlene with Beacons of Balance. And I'm, I'm Joanne. Here, the co-host Joanne. And we have our wonderful guest speaker that I'll shortly introduce, Sunny Dawn Johnston. But welcome to Beacons of Balance. Thank you for being with us. This is a, a station that's all about being in balance. We, our world is a world of duality, up, down, black, white, left, right, whatever. It's never going to go away. And we're trying to live it in balance because everything is in such chaos, especially right now with everything that's going on in the world. Yeah. So we'll we'll share little pearls of wisdom from ourselves and from people we bring on to help bring it back into balance. It's for ourselves also and you. And remember, you're important. <laughs> wow. Sister, it has been like, I feel, how long has it been? Anyway, I'm looking at your bio. Oh, my God, girl, we need like five podcasts just to let everybody know yeah. what you, you don't have to share all that stuff don't don't you worry oh my god no like I'm, I'm just looking at the highlights you know everyone knows you're a world-renowned psychic medium which is very cool uh you're a regular contributor to women's world magazine i did not know that sunny i was I, at a grocery store and i opened up like what <laughs> so cool I mean, yeah it's kind really. of fun to my granddaughter thought it was really cool when my picture yeah. was in the magazine that was in the store at target she's like oh my god I, I know, I was doing this in Ohio, I swear to God. And then you penned like 22 books. Oh. Holy cow. And then all the meditation CDs, well, we don't call them CDs anymore. They're probably, what, MP3s now? Uh, <laughs> and then the book that really puts you on the map. My favorite, by the way, I promote this constantly. Yeah, I just that's told it. people on my Facebook, get this book. Because it covers all the archangels and your amazing story. And then you also have a book, Love Never Ends. And then you've got Elevate Your Life. And then you've got this new thing, Intuition 365 Playground. 30 years experience. And then, oh my gosh, what else? Jewelry line. Hello. <laughs> I don't know how. To... Really? You have a jewelry line? When do you have time to do this? I'm... Oh, wow. You should see you know, her. I, like, I, I'm, I, a blinger. I'm a blinger, Sonny. I'm a blinger. I know, me too, girl. I uh, love it. I know. You're the bling that. chips. <laughs> you should see her jewelry. It is. And she has one with a lighthouse, don't you? Yeah, I sure Oh, do. my God. We have to yeah. have that. Lighthouse. We need to get that for each other for Christmas early. Yeah, Sunday. yeah. It's like, is that Swarovski crystal, Sunny? Swarovski. You got it. Oh, Look at you. Go. You know all of it, girl. Good hey, job. I know, your, I know your story. I <laughs> totally know your story. So I would love to, you know, start with your backstory because you know which one I found so interesting is when your brother, was it Shad, when he was five? Yeah. He saw the angels in your house, but you felt them. Can you? Oh. Yeah, there's there's two pieces. The way I start with the way I opened up to this world in the first place was uh, when I was 13 years old. I went to bed one night and um, I woke up in the middle of the night and uh, rolled over and I saw a beautiful, colorful winged being above my bed. And I'd never like I didn't I didn't have any experience with angels. I didn't have any background in angels. I was raised not religious, but around all my family was Mormon. And so I was from Utah and angels are not a big topic in the Mormon church. And so really? um, mm -mm, huh. they're not. And so um, it wasn't like I didn't I didn't know even what it was. So this this feeling that I got was so like just like <sighs> that's what it was. And um, and I was so calm and I'm 13. So I just rolled over and went back to sleep like Oh, that's so nice. And then when I woke up in the morning, then my head kicked in and I'm like, oh my God, what was that? And I ran downstairs and told my mom, you know, and, and then she's like, what was your guardian angel? And that kind of opened the door to all of, all of this in my reality, which was 40 years ago last month. Wow. 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 Now, um, Sonny, Sonny, were you going through something? If I could ask, were you yeah. going through something at that period at 13? For yeah. sure I was. I mean, <laughs> who isn't at 13? Oh, right? I know. 13. Well, yes. I mean, but in yeah, general, I, 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 I'm asking if there was something significant that yeah. occurred, yeah. some illness or something in the. Yeah. You know, I, I was, so I lived in Salt Lake City, Utah. I wasn't Mormon. And at that time, 90% of the population was. So I didn't fit in. I was overweight. So I didn't fit in. I went to classes a couple of years ahead of me, so I didn't fit in. So I was in a really kind of depressed state because I that's all I wanted to do was be like everybody else, and I wasn't. Of course, yeah. And then, then I had an angel experience, which just made me not fit in even more. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so the story that Joanne is talking about is is a great story, and uh, and I've shared it a lot because it gives a a great idea of kind of the power of uh, of the angels and and. And that also that you don't have to be 
of a particular belief, a particular age, anything in order to be open to them. And so what happened was just a couple of months after I'd had that experience where I saw my guardian angel, I had been since then having like almost like taking class with them. I would ask questions and I would get answers. It was it was phenomenal. And so this particular day, my parents had decided to go out to dinner because they were arguing a lot. There's a lot of negative energy in our home. My parents were fighting a lot, especially around money, finances, worries, things like that. So they decided to go out for dinner and they were going to leave me with my brother. So I was 13. He was five. They'd never left me with him before. And and the biggest reason really was I just wasn't a kid person. Like I didn't really like, you know, like all the mo- girls babysat at 13. I wasn't that girl. So uh, they left me with him and, and it was first time. And so, you know, I wanted to do a good job, kind of. Uh-huh. And so they left. And about 20 minutes later, my brother, who was upstairs playing, he came running down the stairs and he's crying. And he says, Sonny, all of my friends, now I ought to back up for a moment here. His friends were red, yellow, green, and blue shapes, Bumps. triangles, squares, circles with wings. Those were his friends. And he preferred to play with those friends than actual human friends since he was three. So I knew about his friends, but I also was like, whatever, dude, you're just making this up, right? <laughs> so I kind of roll my eyes. And so he ran down the stairs. He's like, all my friends are black, brown, and green frowny faces. And 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 so his friends had gone and it had this negative energy, whatever, had taken its place. And so I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to be the big sister and I'm going to go up. And so I went to go upstairs because I was going to, what I was going to do was abracadabra because I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so I was going to do a little good. abracadabra and then make it all better and thought that that would work because I really didn't, wasn't sure that I believed him anyway, right? Yeah. But when I went to go up the stairs, there was this energy force that pushed me back. Oh, wow. wow. And that got my attention. That scared me. And so then I grabbed his hand and we ran to the back, the back brick wall of our house. And we sat up against that wall for five hours until my parents came home. Oh, Oh my my goodness. When they came home, I told my mom what happened. I was scared now. I was like shaking. And and I told her what happened. And she said, "Okay, well, I'll have my friend Leo come over. And Leo was an underground psychic in the 70s and 80s in Salt Lake City, Utah. Wow. And there were there were no above ground psychics. I was gonna yeah. say you were a Salt Lake City girl with the Mormons. Holy crap. Yeah, Mormon. yeah it was not a okay. It was not a okay it thing. Didn't... And so she said, Well, I'll call her and I'll have her come over and and she'll um she'll take care of it, basically. And so I'm like, I don't know what take care of it means, but okay. So she came over the next morning and and she said, My mom and I were in the house and kitchen with her. And she said, okay, I'm going to just do a little blessing clearing on the house. I'm going to clear the negative energy. And I'm going to call an Archangel Michael. And once that is complete, he'll take all the negative energy and and you'll be fine. Like the house will be good. And I'm thinking, that sounds way too easy. Like you do not know what I felt. And she's like, no, it's that's what we do. And it works. I'm like, uh, okay, whatever. Okay. So my little brother, five. He goes out to ride his big wheel. He's out there riding his big wheel up and down the street. Do you guys remember big wheels? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Long time ago, right? Yeah. So he's out there riding his big wheel. And so he doesn't know what we're doing. He's just out playing and being a five-year-old. And so um, my mom and I and Leo, uh, she says, let's go to the foyer of the house, the front of the house. And we held hands. And she said, okay, we're going to hold hands. I'm going to want you to close your eyes and I'm going to do the invocation which is why that book is called invoking the archangels oh cool and so we did the she did the invocation and my mom and and her got into this place they closed their eyes well i closed one eye because i'm like i want to see what's going to happen and i was i'm a very curious person by nature and i kind of like my nose and everything that's my nature so i keep one eye open so i had my eye open and she did a blessing a prayer an intention and and it was this was the gist of it it was long Longer than it, but this was a jest. She said, I invoke the blue light of Archangel Michael to surround and protect this home from any negative energy or entity seen or unseen. So it was pretty simple, but it was expanded. She went a little bit deeper. And so when we get done with that, my, my eye was open and not one thing did I see. Nothing happened. Okay. So my mom, she opens her eyes and she goes, oh, 
I already feel so much better. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> so I'm just getting ready to tell them, sorry guys, but nothing happened because I had my eye open and nothing happened. So I'm just getting ready to say that. And my little brother who was outside the whole time, he comes running in right there front door and he opens the door wide and he goes, mommy, there is a great big blue bubble around our house. Ooh, I got, ooh, I got chills. I know I'm getting chills here. Yeah. And, an orb, and so, an orb. An orb. Yep. And yeah. so then I'm like, hmm, okay, well, maybe something happened. <laughs> <laughs> that was your but what that what that did, the cool thing that it did, so it's a great story, but what was really cool about it was as soon as that energy was invoked, invited, <laughs> it appeared. And my wow. brother, who didn't know anything that was happening, saw it. He saw the blue energy surround the house to protect the house. But me, inside the house, my nature as an intuitive, I'm a feeler. That's my my strongest gift oh, yeah. is feeling. Yeah. And because I had my eye open, I hmm. was focused on seeing. Um, but I'm a feeler. Okay. So I missed the experience of feeling the energy because my attention was on trying to see focus to say yeah makes sense makes yeah. sense mm -hmm. wow so it was a great it was a great experience and that just kind of you know when i saw my guardian angel that opened the door well that experience just kind of swung right off of of the hinges and i've been doing it for 40 years and ever since so wow. do, do you think i mean or did you have any other experience before you were the age 13 that you not that i'm conscious of i had or... i had a lot of what i would say you know, I, I, I grew up a lot of, I was in the Philippines for five years. Oh, wow. And um, so from the age of about two, well, one, one to six, I lived in the Philippines. And I had really strong spiritual connections to the people, the land, the, the energy, like the Asian energy. I've always been connected to that since I was young. And I, I, I saw things then that at that time, I didn't know if they were real or not real because I was a kid, right? Um, yeah. But when I moved to the States, I don't have any cognizant recollection Word. of any type of metaphysical, spiritual experience outside of knowing. Just I just knew things. I knew things that I shouldn't know at a young age. And so I had those types of experiences. As far as visual things, that was the first time I'd ever visualized, visually seen something. Wow. Sonny, when you were in the Philippines, I know they have, they're they really known for their special healers that they put their hands right into the body. Mm -hmm. Did you ever witness that when you were there? I didn't. You know, the, the only thing that I witnessed that was really interesting was dad had actually taken me to the farmer's market and I was three years old and I was up on his shoulders and they were having an Easter celebration. And, and in the Easter celebration in the Philippines on the main road, mm -hmm. what they would do is they actually had a cross and people volunteered to be crucified to the cross, literally oh. hung with their hands oh on the God. cross as people walked down the, walked them down uh, this particular pathway. And then I think it was every half a mile or so a yeah. new person would volunteer and that was like a Oof. sacred blessing to them but me yeah. my dad's six five so me as a three-year-old on top of a six five and all the filipino people that are short yeah. i saw my dad didn't mean for me to see that but i saw the whole thing and i asked him i said daddy what you know what what are they doing because i saw the blood i mean it was it was traumatized a for a and he said they're 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 practicing their religion. Oh. And that planted a seed for me that then I went to Utah. <laughs> wow. And more religion. And I had a very strong aversion to religion because of what I witnessed. And then, of course, being raised in an environment that I wasn't religious was a real struggle for me. I had a lot of of, of conflict internally for many, many years. I don't any longer, but it was a huge challenge. So that was the probably the biggest thing that stood out to me that that I took with me as far as the sacred energy and things like that and healing. The, the people of the Philippines were such a, a gentle, like I love Thailand, same energy. I, right? Thailand, they're very oh, spiritual. Just I that like gentle. Energy. Yeah, China's so, different, but yeah, Thailand. China's different. I've been to China, China too. China's China's China. Like, yes, yeah, definitely. that's not the same. <laughs> no, no. 
Um, so Sunny, take us to the point when you were like, I think you were 18 when you had a baby and you were in the hospital, something happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was that, that with was Arizona? Actually, um, this was actually my son crew. So oh. when I was 18, I uh, found out I was pregnant and was not planned, not prepared in any way. It was I was on birth control pills. I had had a strep throat. And so I'd taken antibiotics. And back then, they didn't oh, know the antibiotics yeah. made birth control pills not work. So when I found out I was pregnant, I was devastated. Like, I never planned to actually have children. I can't and even... so when I found out, I was very, number one, I was angry. And I was scared to death. Like, how am I going to raise a child? And then I would look at the guy that it was my boyfriend who was an alcoholic at 19 and I'm like, oh my God, how are we going to do this, right? And so it was a really difficult pregnancy. So by the time I was four months pregnant, I developed toxemia, which had turned into preeclampsia, which turned into eclampsia. So I was on complete bed rest the, most of the pregnancy. And and that pregnancy was, you know, the way I look at it is my body was toxic because my thoughts were toxic. My feelings were toxic. It literally took over uh, my body. And when you have toxemia and eclampsia, it's your 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 body is is trying to basically kill the baby and you like you 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 can't function without uh, medical intervention you you can't live without medical intervention and so I was on a lot of medications when I finally went in to have my son um, I was induced did a thirty four hour labor I dilated to one half of one <laughs> centimeter <laughs> and uh, they sent me home and so I went home. And then 10 days later, they brought me back in, induced me again, 36 hours of labor, and I had a stroke while I was in labor. You had a stroke? I did. My blood pressure was like 260 over 220, some crazy number. Wow. And so they did rush me in to do an emergency C-section to try to save one of us because they didn't think they were going to be able to save both of us. And and so they they took the baby. Uh, my son was healthy, and uh, and that was beautiful and amazing. Um, but I, within a couple of days, developed 106.3 degree temperature. And I had that temperature and that infection for almost three weeks. So the baby went home and I did not. And um, and it was a very, very difficult time. I know a lot of people um, recognize and understand NDEs now, but we didn't know what those were then. And, sure. and we didn't talk about them, certainly. And so most of that time I kind of spent in, I was out of my body almost the entire time, you know, the, they didn't know what to do for me. So I, I was literally from my breast to my knees, just oozing infection. Oh my God. Um, they went back in and they did another C-section and went in to see if they uh, could find any utensils. They thought maybe they left something inside of me when they did the the cesarean. And what ended up happening is that the about two and a half weeks into it, my doctor came in and he um, sat me down. I was by myself because I couldn't be around people either. I had one visitor and that was my dad because they didn't know what I had. So they didn't know how to handle it. And so I was by myself and I was 18. Well, I had just turned 19 at this point. And they said, we don't think you're going to make it through the night. And there's nothing else we can do. We're taking the taking you off the antibiotics. Uh, they're not working. We need to know who your son goes to if you don't live. That's heavy and stuff. That was and it was huge. And the, and the thing was, is you know, I, I was very naive at at, at that age. Um, you know, I had been raised in Salt Lake City, which kind of had this kind of a bubble of protection around uh, kids in general there. And I just moved to California, and I was like. I just had a baby like people don't die having babies and that at this time it was 1990 and and I'm in a hospital like that's where you go to get help and you're t just telling me you can't do and like I just was very naive and thinking that well if you go to the hospital and you're sick they make you better right that was just my kind of thought and so when um when the doctor left that's when I realized how sick I was I didn't I didn't know because I was so out of my body I just really didn't know and when I sat with that I'm like Oh my God, like I'm going to die. Like I haven't seen my son since, since he was two days old and I'm not wow. going to live. And so I felt intuitively that number one, I needed to ask for help. And so I asked, I, I didn't know how to ask for help because I had a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and, and really struggled with those types of value and worth and all those things. So I called all of my family who are all religious and I was not and had a lot of issue with it. But I called them all and I just said, I need, 
I need prayers. I need love. I need healing. I need light. Like I need something. It was a three hundred twenty-three dollar phone bill because that's what back when you paid for long distance, right? Oh, yeah. And so I did that. And then as I laid there, so my arms were strapped down because of my infection because it was so painful. Um, so I was in, if you can imagine, laying down in the bed. I was in like a open hearted, open position. Yeah. And um, Archangel Raphael appeared at my feet. And you actually I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. I felt him. I saw the beautiful green emerald energy at the at the foot of my bed. And he just told me to breathe in his energy. So oh, I bre would breathe in the green and I would breathe out what was like sticky tar. That's how it it wow. I perceived it. And um and I did that until I fell asleep somewhere, but over the next twelve hours I was in that kind of state. Um, and when I woke up, my fever had finally broke. Wow. And did, did the angel weeks, give you any messages when he appeared to you? Um, there was no, there was no communication outside of you are healed. And it's like telepathic? And, or? Yes. It was all telepathic. Right, even, even telepathic. when I was, you know, when people ask like, well, did you have an NDE? I didn't have what people would call the traditional NDE because most people, when they have that near death experience, they see a white light and they go to the light. I didn't see anything. It was, I saw what was happening to my body. So I was above my body in the room. I saw my nurses, like I know what, but I still to this day can see. Uh, I had a male nurse, which I was so embarrassed because again, I'm only 18. Um, yeah. and I had a male nurse that would come in and he would clean the infection like they clean burn victims. They'd have to scrape off the infection and it was horribly painful. So I think I would just check out. But when I would come in, he had three calyx on the top of his head. I'll never forget him. I don't even know what his face looks like. I only saw from the higher vision, right? Sure. So in my when I was having those NDEs, I never I never went to a light. So I don't think I was ever going to leave. Um, I don't ever feel like I had the choice because if I would have had the choice, I think I would have bailed. <laughs> oh, but it's but, still, as you're saying, not traditional, but it's still considered. Uh, it would still be considered an yeah, out-of-body experience. Yeah, given all these different labels and that. Absolutely. Uh, right. Did you? What did um, Raphael look like? I know you said the green. Eminent. So the, what, for me like at that formation. time, yeah, yeah, that time it was this beautiful green energy, and it had the what I would say is like the impression of what we would see an angel with now at, at this time, right? Like how we would um, imagine what an angel looks like. Now, you know, 40 years later or 35, I don't have that experience. They just come as energy, as light beings. But then I think I needed the form so that I wasn't scared because everything around me was so scary. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I would actually see that green energy as I would breathe it in. I would see it move through like it started my feet. It would move up my body. It would come all the way up. It would move around this the infected area, which I could I didn't even know what it looked like because I couldn't sit up and then I would breathe out the gut. So I literally had this experience of the visual, the auditory. I embodied the end. It was, it was absolutely, I knew the presence. Like it was all of your intuitive players, clairvoyant, audience, sentient, cognizant, all of them and embodied inside of me. Wow. And, wow. and what was amazing was the next day, what, once my fever broke, you know, they said, okay, it's, you're going to be here for a couple of weeks to get healthy. I checked out the next day. I said, uh, you know what? Uh, one way or another, he told me I'm healed. I'm leaving. And it was a long time to actually be healed. But the start of it, that's all I needed. Right. And so I left because I said, I'm going to see my baby. Yeah. Let me ask you something. When you see energies now, I don't know if you could see this if I hold it up. Can you see that? Yep. Yep. Is that anything that you're familiar with? Um, you know, yeah. it takes on nope. a lot of dip. So a lot of people will see what we call orbs now and people see that and they oh, think it has to be like a perfect circle. It's all right. different forms of energy. So yeah, it can be more. Inch. Yep. It doesn't have to be like perfectly round. It can have a, a bit of form, different shapes, sometimes looks a little bit like electricity, uh, like a lightning kind of storm. Yeah. I was just curious because this was my store that I had you mm -hmm. and it appeared and when I had, this was regular photographs that were, you know, when he developed them. Sure, yeah. So I yep. actually went to the camera shop 
because I know I'm a former check x-ray tech too. So when you have with uh, it's called static, it shows mm-hmm. up on a film like white, like, like you said, like lightning, you know, the, the, the people at the photo uh, photography, like said, no, they didn't know what that was. And that shouldn't be that color. So yeah, I know I, okay. I would say that's for sure. Angelic present. Yeah. I mean, it could, it could also be spirit spirits, but um, the angelic presence, especially if you had an angel store, uh, you know, they're hanging around. Mm-hmm. So for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, th- those were a couple of experiences that really just gave me the absolute validation. And then you would think you would think that with having these experiences that then I would be like, OK, and jump like 100 percent on board. But I still had this sense of like self-value and self-worth struggle that like I don't want to take up their time because there's probably people that are more important in me that need more than I do. Right. And so that was kind of the journey for the next 10 years until I opened up to actually embrace this and do the work I do now. Sonny, don't you find that after you went through that horrific experience that you see life completely different now that everything is so precious? It absolutely, absolutely was for a time. It faded away. You know, uh, it it did for, for several years. I felt like that and I saw things through a different lens. Right. And then I think... Um, life happened and I got busy and I got into the the details of life and um, I forgot until I remembered again. And that was another life experience that caused me to remember. And that time I didn't lose it. So now, absolutely, I've been able to reclaim that. But for probably about eight years or so, I think I just got so into just trying to, you know, survive and take care of everybody and do yeah. all the things you do that I lost it for a little bit, quite honestly. You're still Claire Ascension now. Yeah, like I mean, all all of those Claire, they all come at the same time now. So there's not really one that's that's actually stronger anymore. Oh, okay. um, probably just so because I'm in this. I teach it every day. You know, it's part of my life. But yeah. Claire Sentient, I would say, is always my go-to. Okay. Could could we share with the audience? And this is what I used to share when I had my because I had an angel shop holistic healing center mm-hmm. and i used to share with people because you would hear the things of people having near deaths or a horrific car accident and that's when they would envision because of course you cry out for help no matter who yeah. you are when something happens instinctively we just go help me yeah whatever, right yeah um and i would say to people you know don't wait you don't have to wait until you're in crises yeah you have them come in but they want to be invited and asked in is that you know, Arlene, that is something I teach every time I teach is, hey, uh, you need to ask and well, don't wait till you're on death's door to do it. Exactly. Don't do what I did. Right. You know, you don't have to wait till you're on death's door. Ask, ask now in whatever the situation is. So every morning I start my day as part of my spiritual practice is I ask. Every single day without exception, I ask. I am open to receive all of the love and abundance and support of the universe. And I, I, I ask for help in e- every area that I need and want and and don't even know that I need yet. Why, let me ask this quick question. Why do you feel, and like you said, like Joanne asked that question and you said you did it for a while and then everyday life happens. Mm-hmm. This is always perplexing to me. We know these miracles happen instantaneously. They're around us every moment and we could do so much more even than what we're doing. But mm-hmm. yet- we, like you said, we go off and it's just either we forget, we get so busy. Why do we do that? I mean, I do it myself. I think Joanne, mm-hmm. you do it too. You know, we all oh, do. Right. You know, sure. we're busy. You know, I, I, I think that one of the things is, is we, we start to focus more on the physical than the non-physical. We, yeah. we forget our true essence and we focus on the essence that, that takes up the most time, uh, right. which is the humanness, you know, the, the feeding and and sleeping and watering and and making a living and caretaking and all of those things we see the result of those immediately it's instant gratification you know i i do this and then this happens where with the spirit realm when we're connected to the spirit realm there's such a easy piece there isn't this okay when i do this and i see this it's more of this uh, uh constant energy that's flowing and i think a lot of times we distract ourselves with the humanness to not be in a place of connectedness with our spirits. Uh, because that place, you have to be really honest with yourself. And it's not always easy. Sure. Sunny, I meant to ask you, your mom, her name is Solara? It is. Did she teach spirituality back in the 80s or 90s? 
you know, this is what she did. So she renamed herself when she got divorced about 17 years ago. Okay. Um, and when I was growing up from about the age of 10 mm -hmm. uh, until about 15, she was trying to figure out her way. So she was raised Mormon. And she at 16, she's like, that's not my that's not my gig. But she didn't know what was and she wanted to find something. So when I, you know, then she had kids and she kind of or she's a caretaker. So she focused on all that. But when I was about 10, she started going to different churches. She started looking into different religions, different belief systems. And by the time I was about 12, she had found spirituality, metaphysics, new age, whatever term you want to call no. it. And that really resonated with her. You know, she was a beautiful, intuitive. She's alive. So I said was. A was meaning at that time, she practiced it a lot, right? Um, Such a beautiful and, school. Oh, my God. And I, I, yeah. And so she she finally stepped into who she really is when she changed her name to fit more of, of her nature in, yeah. in who she is. So she wasn't a teacher. But what they did, that underground psychic, the reason she knew the underground psychic is because they would have classes. And what they would do uh, is it, each week, somebody else would host it, kind of like Tupperware parties. Sure. Um, but they would do it that way so that not too many people ask too many questions, right? Oh. So one family would have it one time and then somebody else would have it. And there's only a group of maybe eight or 10, but one was an astrologist, one was a hypnotherapist, one was a psychic, one was a, a crystal healer. Uh, and then there were four or five that were just interested in it. And so they would just take turns uh, so that they could learn and grow. And then they would, they would, read all the old Edgar Casey books and, oh, and yeah. things like that, and then practice and, and work on developing with each other. That's amazing. So, Especially in area. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Food. So out of all your businesses and all your endeavors and so forth and so on, what is the closest to your heart that makes your heart sing and resonate and want to go continue to grow? Oh my goodness. That's so hard because we have the, so I have so many. Because I, love I don't even know all of them, but Joanne. Um, <laughs> you know, I think probably I have a community. It's called Elevate Your Life. And uh, I spent a lot of time in there teaching about spirituality and angels and, and, and connecting with our deceased loved ones. And I also talk about basics of life. You know, I think so often we get so involved in all this external stuff. And I think we really have to come back to basics. And a lot of people forget the basics and the, the, the basics of, of our spiritual connection. So, you know, learning how to ask for help and get grounded, maintain your energy, those kinds of things. I think that's probably my, my biggest passion, that and helping people that are intuitives build their businesses. Because, you know, back in the day when I started it 24 years ago, nobody was doing this stuff and there was no teachers to have and you couldn't sure. go take a class. And, and there wasn't like a, this is the way it was, I muddled my way through it, just like probably you guys did in, in, at that time, right? Joanne right. and I were talking about that as, you know, 30 years ago when we started it, there were three angel books. That was it. Exactly. There wasn't anything else. It was all witches and spells, Sunny. Exactly. Yeah. The Back in the day when I was first opened up to angels, I wanted to go learn more. And so I went to the library as a 13-year-old and I said, I need a book on angels and how to communicate with angels. And the woman looked at me like I had three heads. You're crazy. And she sent me to the occult section. And in the occult section was astrology book, two numerology books, and a book on runes. That was it. Isn't that amazing? But that's the way it was. But yeah, look how it's it was. flipped. I mean, something's happened where people are opening up to spirituality because there's a big shift. Absolutely. I mean, I can't, I don't even know. I've written 12 angel books, so I don't even know how many angel books there are, but there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions right. at this point. So obviously there's there's a shift and I, I have to, I'm not a big fan of media and news media and, and right. things like that. However... I do have to say that in my career, when <clears throat> when shows like um, Medium uh, sure. came out, um, uh, John Edwards doing his thing, I did. Uh, sometimes on some of the old talk shows, even like Donahue, they'd have uh, John Anderson. When they started having... Oh, yeah. Do you remember John Anderson? We met him, Joanne, in Florida. That Yeah, it was called out of the audience. Yeah. He, he would write he used to do this. Yes. He used to... Oh, I remember that. Oh my God. You remember him? 
He was one of the first ones ever out on TV that did, that he, and that was in the 70s yeah, that he, he actually him. did that. And he would say, okay, I, I have this name and, and stand up, but it's for deceased people that you know, that's mm-hmm. that name. And yes. we're sitting there right towards the front of the road, Joanne, and he goes, Arlene. And I looked at her and I said, well, I'm not dead. I'm not. He goes, Arlene, here, now, press it. And I went, what's <laughs> I'm going to stand up, stand up at you. Oh my God. Bobby. Yeah, that's a blast from the past. So I, I do, Very you bad. know, give credit to uh, the media in that way that it's brought this outside of being in the in the closet and, and actually opened it up more mainstream. Because when I first started, it was so um, difficult. Closet. And, oh, closet. Woo, woo. I was did. laughed at when I was opening up my store because there were a lot of men that had businesses in the area and they go, you're doing what? And <laughs> at me. Like, eh. yep. and I'm yep. like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mentioned the word light workers, even like 20 years ago when I named Light Workers Conference, they looked at me like, you don't, what is that? Is this an electrical engineer? Right. What does that mean? <laughs> exactly. You're going to teach us how to hang a chandelier? That's what uh-huh. I was giving on the phone. Yeah. Uh, well, we, yeah. There just wasn't awareness. Yeah. Well, we could go on and on, but we oh are. Oh my God, we need you back. This. There's too much to cover. Yeah, we, well, will you come back? <laughs> sure, absolutely. It was absolutely. wonderful. Um, so the show is, you know, Beacons of Balance, so it's about balance. And what could you share with our audience as far as how do you bring balance into your own personal, i.e. your your life and your families and so forth? What What do you do? What do well, you do yourself? You know, my kids are grown now, so I don't bring balance to them at all. <laughs> I figured out I couldn't control them. So um, oh, right. and hopefully they're learning how to balance their lives. But I think, you know, for me, um, it's changed over the years. And I can really, if I'm being 100% honest, haven't always been great with balance. Uh, I'm more, I am better at balance now than I probably have been in my entire life. And I'm still not fantastic at it because I kind of like to do everything and I kind of have tendency to be extreme. But one of the one of the things I do that really brings me into that centered space every morning is I do five things. And one of them is I meditate. The second one is I call in my angels and I ask for help. The third one is I invite Archangel Michael into my space to help me to maintain my energy every single day. Um, the fourth one is I ask, how may I serve? And the fifth is when I when I take a step on the floor, whatever, whatever that is, the first step I take, I say thank you. Oh, those are great. Great. Help me to Those are wonderful. Oh my God. It's so good to see you, Sunny. I can't even begin to tell you. It's great to see you. And thank you guys so much for having me. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, thank you everyone for uh, watching, listening, for those listening, just get out of here. For those that can see us, I'm saying get out of your headspace and drop into your heart space. Right. It's always about love. Remember each of you matter. You're very important to all of us. Right. And, um, and whatever you do, make it count. You yeah. know, life's precious, really precious. Remember to the, be the beacons of light that you are and just shine it out to everyone. We need exactly. this we need peace in this world. So we and love. Sunny's information will be posted. Yes. Early, yes. People- oh, yes. Everybody, I always forget this. Remember to subscribe, like, leave comments. And Sunny, all your information will be posted below. You can find all her information for. I'm sure you have workshops, talks, your books, everything will be listed there. Joanne, anything else? There's so much. I mean, like I said, we didn't even get into you being a, a psychic detective for the program. <laughs> well, gotta, I know. I've got a, I got a lot of different things out. going on. So, yeah, girl, you have you too like- many. Oh, and I love your heart, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. I love that. The tree. I love, that. I love it. Oh, the tree. So shoulder. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd be happy to come back and we'll talk about one of the other areas if you like, ladies. Thank well, you so much. Oh, yes. my God, yes. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Sunny. Love you. Friend. Love you, love you, love you, sister. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great one. Bye-bye.